equations themselves contain a function and also its first derivative. So we're going to have a look at this point on how to solve second order differential equations. And these are development of the first order ones because we can see that in actual fact what we've got in any equation is we've got some function y, we've got um, a sum or some uh, an addition of its first derivative but also uh, we've got some kind of multiple of its second derivative as well. So we've got some of terms which include a certain amount of a function, its first derivative and also its second order second derivative and that's why we call them second order differential equations and we have accompanied with each term some constant term um, we usually order them in terms of the second derivative first of all and that's our, our standard form a dy uh, d2y by dx squared plus b dy by dx plus cy is equal to and then on the right hand side we've got this uh, f of x some function in x and it's important this we comment a b and c are constants we have to have some kind of second derivative it may be in our equation there is no first derivative or no y function but there must always be a second derivative it's a bit like when we're solving a quadratic equation um, there must also there must always be a squared term so although we could maybe uh, have something like that that would be all three terms we can also have a situation where there's no m term in its own right or perhaps that there's no constant term but there must always be a, a squared term in the same way there needs always to be a second derivative for it to be a second order differential equation hope that makes sense so uh, there are two types of second order differential equations and it all comes down to what's on the right hand side. First scenario is there's a zero on the right hand side and we call that a homogeneous second order differential equation. So if the right hand side is set to equal zero it's homogeneous and if it's not it's non-homogeneous. And there are two different strategies depending on whether our equation is equal to zero or not equal to zero. So the first examples here are going to be what's happening when we've got a homogeneous second order differential equation. Okay, so uh, what we need to do here is have a real look at the general form. We're going to move on and at the moment look at homogeneous equation so let's just uh, reduce the amount of stuff here so that's the form of our differential equation and I've added in the equals zero because we're dealing with homogeneous equations at the moment so what, what can we say uh, we're going to assume at the moment that we know the kind of shape of our solution I know that the, in some ways the, the easiest way to uh, think about a, a differentiable function is an exponential function because they differentiate really easily. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that our solution takes the form of an exponential function y equals e to the power mx. And if we assume that's the form of it, we can uh, construct a kind of a, a way through it we can construct a, an algorithm that helps us to solve it so in other words if we are saying that y is equal to emx is our y function here then if we just pause a moment and think of um, the derivatives of these so if, if y is equal to emx the first derivative will be uh, m times e to the power mx because we're using the chain rule here the second derivative will be the first derivative multiplied by the derivative again which is m so we've got m squared times e to the mx so we've got an expression for each of the derivatives and if we were to substitute that in to the original function we'd end up with this expression here a b and c are our given coefficients and the second derivative is m squared e to the mx first derivative m e to the mx 
and the original function E to the mx. Now, if you notice that there's a common factor of E to the mx, and that's the nice thing about differentiating exponential functions, there's a great similarity in what we've got on, and therefore, this equation must hold for a homogeneous differential equation. In other words, e to the mx multiplied by this quadratic has to give us zero. Now, we know that e to the power mx is never going to be zero for any value, okay? Because for, you know, regardless of what the value of uh, m or x is, uh, we can't ever make that equal to zero. Thus, what we can say is that the only way that equation is going to hold is if am squared plus bm plus c equals zero. In other words, we can deduce that that is actually the, tr the true equation. Okay? So, y equals e to the mx is, this, is a solution of our differential equation if this quadratic equation holds. Now, notice that um, a, b, and c are the given coefficients of the equation that we started with. And all we do is we introduce this m variable uh, to represent the potential solution that we're going to have. And if we find the solutions to that equation, what we end up with are the wee coefficients for our x term. We call this the auxiliary equation. It auxiliary just means to um, to help out or to assist, and this equation is going to assist us in finding our solutions. Okay. So there are effectively. Uh, well, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Just talking through all the theory, and then we'll do an example. So let's see where we're at with things here. So we've got our auxiliary equation, um, which means that we'll end up with potentially, because we've got a quadratic equation, we'll end up potentially with two values for m, perhaps one, if there's repeated roots, or perhaps even a complex uh, solution, okay? However, there's one extra little bit of theory that we need to go over here, and that is this. Say we've got two values. Say we end up with a, a quadratic equation that we can solve for two values, right? So we can say effectively that the two possible solutions, uh, y1, say for instance that we said m is 2 and m was 3, then our solutions y1 would be e to the power 2x and y2 would be e to the power 3x. Okay. However, uh, the way that these equations work and because we're going to be differentiating with them, um, then it's also true, and these are things we can you can explore a wee bit more. I'm not going to go into the theory behind it just now, and you can do that if you wish. Um, if these two are independent solutions, then we can also say that the sum of these two is also a solution. So in other words, my kind of overall solution might look like y equals e to the 2x plus e to the power 3x. But that will also be a solution of the differential equation. Even more than that, any multiple of either y1 or y2 would be a solution. So for instance, if I were to uh, shove in to y1 here uh, a 4, then that would also be a solution. If I were to put a 5 in to y2 and make it 5 e to the 3x, then that would also be a valid solution. So the idea is that any multiple of y1 or any multiple of y2 is also a solution. So in other words, what we're really looking at is the fact that we could put in a constant term here and a constant term here, which is what we do. We can basically call them A and B. So the overall uh, form of the equation looks like this. We can say that the solution y is equal to any multiple of e to the m1x, our first solution, plus any multiple of e to the m2x, our second value for m. And that's the general form of 
our solution. So in other words, once we know m1 and m2, and we know that that's an exponential function, we can say the overall solution could be a sum of the two values, and it could be any multiple of either of those. So we have to consider the fact that there's um, a, a capital A and B are constant terms. And we'll look at maybe working them out a wee bit later. So lastly, and this is a huge bit of, of theory because we need to get this right, there are three possible solutions to our auxiliary equation. We know that we could have two distinct real roots, we could get equal roots, or we could get complex roots. So just very quickly, um, these are the kind of things to consider, and then we're going to put it all together in the next three examples. If, in some ways, the uh, simplest way is what happens when we get two distinct roots. Well, that's fine. We, uh, we put them in for m1 and m2, and that's our solution. No problem. Uh, the second one is what happens when we get uh, equal roots. In other words, the two values for m1 and m2 are the same. That just means we've got a common factor of that e to the mx. That number's the same. And so we write it down with a common factor. But there's a little, again, a little bit of theory here. Rather than just having a plus b as, an, as a new constant term, we introduce a multiple x. And that helps to keep the two terms distinct. Again, multiplying any term by this variable here will also be a solution that we can use. So our general form looks like that. And then we'll go over some examples of that in a little while. And thirdly, if you've got a complex root, this is one that's maybe a bit the hardest one to kind of get your head around um, if you want to explore it. But I'm just going to put it out there just now. If you end up with a complex root where the real part is p, then you notice that that becomes the m term in your exponential function. And the imaginary part, q, becomes the, a multiple of this angle here. Now note that it's not, that's not a cos qx plus b sine qx is not in polar form. It's not cos x plus i sine x like we're used to in complex numbers. This, these are actual um, real values here. There's no imaginary part in the function. And again, there's a lot of, uh, you could explore why that's the case. And at the moment, it's, I'm not going to go into the reason why. If you're very welcome to explore that, there's other websites and stuff that will do that for you. Okay. So that's the whole theory of it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to include the first example here, uh, example 15, and uh, uh, the other two examples, 16 and 17. So I'm going to do one of each um, example. So example 15 is going to be real distinct. Example 16 is going to be equal roots. And example 17 is going to be complex roots. So you can work your way through them. OK, so here we go with example uh, 15 the general solution of. I've got a second order differential equation and just by looking at it I can see it's uh, homogeneous which is equal to zero so I can employ this strategy and we've got a second order uh, differential equation on the left hand side. So the first thing I'm going to do is to introduce my auxiliary equation. Oh, oops, I can't help if I could spell it. I've just been talking so much. Oh, and the way we create our auxiliary equation is remember that the coefficients remain the same. So I've got 1, negative 4, and plus 3. And instead of the dy by dx, I'm just using the letter m. So it's basically 1m squared minus 4m plus 3 equals 0. Notice it's not the y term effectively disappears. We're just using that plus 3 as a constant term. That's my auxiliary equation. I want to do a wee quick check. And you should I recommend that you check the discriminant first. It helps to get your head around where you're going with this. So b squared negative 4 squared is 16 minus 4 times 1 times 3 which means I've got 16 minus 12, which is 4, which tells me that I'm going to have distinct roots. It also tells me uh, that the particular form my solution is going to take. 
So I know that I can fa usually factorise this. It's not going to need the quadratic formula when I know that I've got distinct roots. Um, my two factors of plus 3, the positive 3 that add together to negative 4, uh, would be negative 3 and negative 1. Um, and so we can say either m minus 3 equals 0 or m minus 1 equals 0 if we've got a quadratic equation. So m equals 3 or m equals 1 are our two values for m, which means that we can say our general solution I'm going to write it out in the generic form as I showed you in that uh, last slide there for distinct roots our solution is going to look like y equals a times e to the m1x plus b times e to the m2x write that down every time so that you remember it we don't have at the moment values for a and b but we do have a value for m so we've got three and we've got one it doesn't matter which order you do them in i'm just going to keep them in numerical order increasing numerical order so i put in a, a e to the x plus b e to the 3x and that's it that's my solution so after all that talking and explanation, um, you can actually apply the solution quite easily as long as you use the auxiliary equation, uh, check the nature of the roots, work out the values for m, and use the, cor the correct one of three possible forms of our general solution. We would need more information to find a and b, and we'll explore that later in our um, kind of definite integral so we can work out or definite uh, partic particular solution, sorry. Okay, so that's example 15. Thanks for following that. Hopefully that's been helpful. And I'll put example 16 and 17 as separate videos, okay?